Right. Um, I think that we can start. Um, so, hello everyone. We will be talking about enabling Zephyr on your hardware platform. Anyone here has experience with Zephyr development? Well, good audience. Um, what about adding uh, new hardware supporting Zephyr? Maureen, of course. <laughs> Okay, so I am Diego Sueiro. I am Embedded Linux Platform Engineer at Sepura in the UK. Uh, they are in Cambridge. And I am uh, the CEO of Embarcados, which means Embedded. Uh, it is a website uh, where we publish articles about embedded systems development in Portuguese. Uh, so. Let's see our agenda for today. So um, how we are going to see how hardware is, uh, how is the hardware support implementation in Zephyr, how we can add a new hole, a hardware abstraction layer, how do we add a new SOC, uh, adding new drivers aboard, some debugging tips, and a hardware support checklist, depending on what you want to add, uh, I will give you a checklist and uh, how do you contribute to mainline. Uh, please, please feel free to interrupt me to make questions. Uh, I'll try to make this presentation in 30 minutes and if you want we can have a QA session in the end. So let's see how it goes. And, but if we don't have time, I am, totally, I am glad to address any questions that you have offline, okay? So before we begin, uh, just a few words. Uh, this is not an introduction to Zephyr. Uh, for these, I think we already had uh, some presentations here about Zephyr, but you can find a lot of documentation and other presentations online. Uh, the presentation is very dense. I had to shrink it a lot, but I still think that it's very dense. Uh, I will not cover every slide in detail because the idea is to give you a reference to help when you decide to add a new hardware platform, uh, you can have a good slides as reference, some guides to, for example, like uh, what kind of source files you need to look to add support for your new hardware. The source code uh, examples are based on the master branch, on this uh, specific commit. And uh, when I finished this presentation right before the version 113, and then one day, on the week after the version 113, a lot of things changed, some paths, so I spent a lot of hours updating the presentation. And when I was looking to the Zephyr source code last week, I saw that uh, I had another outdated information. But that's okay, I will point to you out what is outdated, but maybe when you actually go to add the support for your hardware, some of this information can be outdated, okay? Um, some source code that I will show here will be stripped just to fit on the screen and give you the main idea, what do we have on the source code. Um, all the examples are based on the Zephyr running on the uh, ARM Cortex M4 core inside the IMX7 processor. So this processor has a Cortex A7 and a Cortex M4. So I personally worked on porting Zephyr to run on the Cortex M4 inside of this processor. And this presentation will not cover all the hardware aspects that we have on Zephyr, like adding a new CPU core and this is actually a we very well documented in the Zephyr website. Uh, so let's start with the hardware support implementation in Zephyr. Uh, in this diagram, uh, we represent from bottom to top the hardware configuration hi hierarchy. So we have the architecture, CPU core, the SOC family, the SOC series, the SOC itself, our drivers, and the board. That can be our product, our, the hardware platform for our product. 
we can optionally make use of a hardware abstraction layer to support the implementation of these higher level uh, hardware uh, configuration and implementation. Uh, I will give uh, more details uh, about the how later. So let's take a look on that um, hierarchy of the hardware configuration. So we first have uh, our architecture, that is the CPU core itself, like Ar ARM, ARC, x86, and so on. Then the CPU core is where we find uh, the um, early boot sequence, interrupt and exception handling, thread creation and termination, and context to switching, fault management, and etc. Some examples like the Cortex M0, M4, Atom, and others. Then we have the SOC family, which represents a single SOC type that can have more than one variations in terms of peripherals or features, like we, for example, the Kinets, the IMX family, the um, STM32, and other ones. Then we have the SOC series that represents the specific peripherals and features for an SOC family variation. I think it's easier to understand by example. So we have the, inside the Kinets, we have the Kinets K6X, the KW something for the IMX, IMX6, IMX7, okay? And then uh, the SOC that is actually soldered on your hardware, and it's all associated the configuration like pin muxing, clock rate, and other things. Then you have the drivers, include a device uh, model uh, that is responsible for configuring and initializing these drivers, and each driver follows a device model API. And, an, it, and it's specified, and each driver has its own API as well. And uh, you have drivers like interrupt controllers, serial communication, and timer, and what we normally find uh, in Linux or operating systems. And then the board, which includes the SOC, uh, and its associated peripherals and features as well as external components, uh, and you can represent your product as a board, or you have more than 100 boards available to use with Zephyr. Uh, so in Zephyr, basically, you can you configure the hardware in a top level uh, fashion and in a low level. In the top level, you will be using symbols defined in k-configs. And the final processing of this series of k-configs will be inside of these build folders. So the normal dot config and a uh, header file, okay? Then the low level hardware specific configurations are defined using device tree. And the final processing of these device tree files are in these paths inside the build folder. And the device tree layout is as much as the same as we find in the Linux kernel. There is no differences. If you, if you are already familiar with the Linux kernel device tree, here is the same thing. But the main difference is in the Linux kernel, it uses the DTBO and parse, the kernel parses that information at runtime and applies the configuration that uh, you set in the device tree. In Zephyr, it is basically used to generate hash defines. So it's defines that will be consumed by drivers or your application source code, okay? Uh, so let's see now how we add a new hall. So uh, the hall um, is added to support the SOC, board, and drivers implementations. 
It is uh, basically low-level libraries, mostly implemented by the SOC vendor, to interface and configure the hardware. The different types of hole and uh, the pros and cons uh, are covered in Maureen's presentation. I think you've done last year? Yeah, I was here last year. So uh, she explains the different types of holes and uh, the abstractions. And so when you are adding a new hole in the Zephyr source code, the Zephyr uh, technical steering commit uh, we will approve for the source code that are known Apache 2 license. And it's normally, it's located on this folder, ext how the vendor, and the library name. We will see some example later. Uh, so just bug fixing uh, modifications are allowed on these source or header files, okay? Uh, there is no standard coding style or directory structure, how you normally see in the rest of the Zephyr source code. Almost all ARM devices follow the CMC's standard headers for registers manipulation. It is enabled with a config option. In this case, it's an example of how we enable the IMX hall. And has a set of kconfig and cmakelist file to determine what the, the directories of the source code include paths and so on. Uh, this is an example for the IMX7 um, where I imported the source code from the NXP FreeRTOS BSP into this path. So we can see on the root of this path we have a CMake list file uh, kconfig and a readme file. Then we have a drivers folder with the, the drivers for I2C interface, UART and other processor features and a device folder where uh, here we have the CMC's header, CMC's compatible header. And uh, as you can see in, inside the same hole we support the IMX7 and the IMX6. So they are different SOC series from the same SOC family that is the IMX. Any questions? Okay. So the read, the read file, read me file. So this is what uh, the, uh, the Zephyr uh, technical steering committee will look and you need to follow the standard, the structure that they, they put on this web page where you basically, you, you list from where you are getting the source code, uh, the, the specific commit that you are importing, the purpose, description, or some dependencies, if it has external dependencies or dependencies even inside the, the Zephyr source code. Uh, so this is an example of the kconfig. So you can see that we are set, we, we are declaring the, the symbol here of the has IMX hall. And when it is enabled, we have other, K, uh, other config symbols that we can use. So like this is uh, internal um, processor feature, the RDC, that is the resource domain controller, when you are sharing resources between the two cores. This is the clock control module. Then you have the, for the GPIO, I2C. These symbols are used to control what we wanted to compile inside the hole. Okay? This is, and then the CMake list file where CMake will find the source code. Okay? So if we are using the IMX7, it will set this IMX device and then it will add this proper folder as an include folder. If you are using the IMX6, it's gonna change this folder, okay? And the same thing for, uh, yeah, this is it. And for compiling as well. The drivers folder is common, in this case for both SOC series. <coughs> Sorry. 
<clears throat> so when we, when the configuration process finishes, uh, we generate a .config file, and for the IMX, this is in, in a specific sample uh, application. This is what the config symbols that were set uh, for the IMX hall. We are going to use GPIO and I square C. So let's talk about um, uh, how we add support for a new SOC. When implementing a new SOC, we define the SOC family, the SOC series, the SOC, and the SOC part number configurations. It is located on uh, SOC, SOC, architecture, SOC family, and the SOC series. Uh, the SOC, uh, it, it has an SOC.c file that it implements the normal SOC initializations like clock, cache, memories, or even implementing uh, cheap erratas. Uh, it, is calling, it is called during the system initialization process with the priority zero. It provides a SOC header, which will be included by drivers or even by the board implementation. It can extend the functionalities not provided by the vendor hall, so things that you are missing in the vendor hall because you are not allowed to change the vendor hall, Mary will not accept that. So you put on this folder, okay? Um, and uh, it contains a set of kconfig files and device tree fix-ups. I will explain later about these device uh, uh, tree fix-ups, okay? So, um, The default architecture and the SOC family, the SOC series configs, are, select, are selected in the board def config files. And in this example here for the Toradex Colibri module, uh, we set uh, the, uh, so this is the def config file for the board. We select the ARM architecture, the IMX family, and the IMX7 underscore M4 family. And these default configurations will dictate what kconfig files will be sourced and what config entries will be selected and generated for the SOC presented on the hardware platform. Everything will start from here. And it contains a DTSI file defining the SOC peripherals and features, and it's located in this folder, DTS, architecture, the vendor, vendor underscore, the SOC name, and DTSI. So it may have the DTS fix up that contain mappings from the existing kconfig options to the actual underlying DTS deri derivated uh, configuration defined. I know that it seems a little bit confusing what I wrote here, but I will show you an example, and I'm pretty sure that you understand what I'm trying to say here, okay? And this is one thing that changed recently. The, the name of the, the, the file is not dts.fixup anymore, it's dts underscore fixup dot h. But the content is pretty much the same, nothing changed. So this is an example of the DTSI file for the um, IMX7, Cortex-M4. Uh, so it looks like uh, the normal uh, DTS that we find in the Linux kernel. So we have the CPU node, we set the compatible string, and then we set uh, the memories that we have available for this processor. And note that this source code is stripped. We have much more information in here. This is an example how we set, we uh, declare the GPIO 7 node. 
So we put a compatible string, the registers, range, the interrupts, a label. This is the resource domain controller, uh, the permissions that we are gonna add for this specific resource, and the number of the, the, the bits, the number of the bits of the RQ priority for this processor. Uh, this is an example of the uh, DTS fix-up. So now I think you're gonna understand what I meant to say on that uh, statement. So in the left side here, the GPIO driver is common for the IMX7 and IMX6. And it is consuming these defines. But when the DTS file is processed, the defines that it generates are this one with the register address, okay? So we use the DTS fix up to be able the driver to consume the, the data that we define it in the device tree. You can use aliases to get rid of this, uh, but this is now uh, most of the SOCs you are gonna see this kind of uh, defines in there. And the same idea applies for the UART and other interfaces. So, uh, here uh, we can see an example of the directory structure for the SOC series, the IMX7 SOC series. Uh, again, this root folder is common for the IMX6, so these files, these kconfigs and cmake lists are common between IMX7 and 6. And then on the IMX7 you have these lists of the kconfig files and source code files as well. A lot of kconfig files, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, you need you need to to you need to know in advance what the device tree is generating as a define, and then if you want to abstract that define, you you put in there. I'm not sure if I understood your question, or even if I answered. Like you have your DTS, and then you have the node, and then you have some Yeah. So I was wondering, like, the, the, the generated defines, is that like a deterministic predictable yes. function of the structure of the DTS? Yes, yes. You can, uh, I, I haven't put it here, but you have some temporary files of the DTS processing that you can understand how it is generating this. And it's basically, I think it's Python code, it's not very complicated to understand how <coughs> it's doing stuff. But I think that uh, they are about to change a little bit uh, this, for example, to you to get r rid of this DTS fix up because it's a manual process and why we do we need this manual process. So uh, we have a lot of kconfig files, unfortunately. Uh, so when you run the, the, the CMake command to configure the build, it will source all these kconfig files. Uh, I haven't found in the Zephyr documentation the exactly order that it does this the sorcery of the kconfigs. Maybe this is, uh, you can have different orders depending on the architecture or the SOC. But what I could find is that mostly for ARM platforms, it will follow this. And here we have this, uh, I put the environment variables and so as you can see, a lot of config, uh, kconfig files. And specifically for the, Toradex Colibri, resolving that paths and environment variables, we will source all these kconfig files. And when we are interested about this SOC, these are the files that will be setting the kconfig symbols related to the SOC. 
unfortunately, we will not have time to go in each file in detail to see what it's setting or not, where you need to set this specific symbol. But I think that maybe this is a good reference for you when you decide, okay, no, I need to add a new SOC. So what kind of file do I need to change? So maybe this, is, this will be a good reference. And then you go on those files and see, oh, okay, in here I am setting, I don't know, uh, uh, I'm def declaring the symbols for the peripherals interfaces, or in here is different uh, aspects of the hardware, okay? Uh, <coughs> when the configuration process finishes, we will have uh, all these configurations, uh, these configs related to the SOC in this dot config file inside the build folder. In this case, it's for the shell module. So we have the SOC, the SOC series, number of our queues, uh, clock information, the SOC part number, the family. So these are all related to the SOC and these are somehow all defined on that different kconfig files. Uh, now let's talk about um, adding new drivers. So, uh, as we know, the driver provides interface to the hardware. Nothing new. Uh, the source code is located on drivers and then the driver type, like I2C, serial, uh, spy, and so on. Uh, it must implement uh, the API defined in the driver type header, so you're gonna have include i2c.h, spy, serial. So uh, it follows the strategy of one driver, multiple instances. Um, the selection and configuration is done via kconfigs and device tree. You can mix as well. Uh, may use the vendor hall, and in this case we call this driver as a shim driver because this is basically a, an adaptation layer between what we have in the SOC, the, the, the vendor hall, and what the driver needs to expose to, to the applications. Its initialization is performed uh, during the kernel boot. It has a YAML file describing the device tree nodes and properties. It has a device tree file to define the driver's properties and configurations, okay? There is a good uh, ramp up documentation available in the Zephyr website. And uh, it's a very big topic, it's, it's huge. I even tried to put some source code here, but then I said, no, I will not have time to go for it. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, if, you, if you are familiar with the Linux kernel drivers implementation, you will, f you will feel good here, okay? And you can use a lot of uh, drivers for other SOCs as a base to understand the code, the, the code structure. So uh, following our agenda, let's see how we add a new board. Any questions? No? So like I said, a board can represent the application hardware platform. The source code is located in here, boards, architecture, and the board name. It extends the SOC, enabling or disabling uh, its peripherals and features, and instantiate external device like accelerometer, thermometers, and it uses, it has a device tree associated to it as well, and use a kconfig. It may apply the pmuxing configuration for the, sp the specific SOC, has a board header to be used by drivers or your application, and contains a def config file, like I told you before, to select uh, which SOC is used on your hardware platform. 
It may set flash partitions in the device tree file, may include a DTS fix up as well. So maybe you will have to do that DTS fix up for the external I2C devices like accelerometer. When the, div the, the device tree processing occurs, uh, unfortunately, I don't have an example here, but for an, ex an, ex uh, an accelerometer with a specific I2C address, the define generated will include the I2C address in the define name. But your driver doesn't care about this. It, it, it only wants to know what is the value of the, the I2C address, for example. So then you can fix up this in the DTS fix up file may include other source files to configure or implement specific features of your board, may provide a board CMake to instruct how to flash and debug the target. We'll have a YAML file as well uh, to list board properties like flash, RAM sizes, toolchain usage, uh, and must have a documentation file listing the supported features, interfaces. Of course, if you want to choose upstream your hardware support. So uh, here, an example for the Colibri. So we can see the board header, the CMake list file, def config, device tree, YAML, the documentation folder. And all, again, so in this case, we have two can config files and uh, source code just for applying pmuxing. The board YAML file, so in this example, we use by default uh, 32 kilobytes of RAM and flash. We say which tool chain we are using and some uh, we wanted to ignore tests for NAT and Bluetooth. This is when Zephyr in um, continuous integration, it runs a lot of sample apps and tests. And when it, uh, it is building, for example, to test Bluetooth, it will not build for the Colibri because Colibri doesn't support Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, so here is the DTS for the Colibri board. Uh, it includes the IMX7 DTSI that we saw earlier, uh, set a compatible string. So we set uh, some aliases. So these aliases will uh, help to not generate that uh, very strange defines that we can use easily on the source code. We choose which flash uh, we are going to use and uh, RAM and we are choosing which UART interface is going to be used by the Zephyr console. We set uh, an LED as well to this specific GPIO. Then we have a GPIO key, a, a user switch to this specific GPIO as well. For the UART interface, we, okay, let's compile, let's use it and set the boundary rate for instance. And we enable GPIOs, I2C interfaces, PWM, so it's very simple. Uh, this is an example of the kconfig.board file for the Colibri. So yeah, we are basically defining the <laughs> symbol here for this board and say that we depends on the this SOC series and we are using this specific part number. This is an example of the kconfig.defconfig. So here we basically put the invisible symbols that are not selectable by the user in the make menu config. So it thinks that we don't want the user to be able to select. This is under your control, okay? And you can see, so if we are using Colibri, uh, if the GPIO is enabled, we will by default uh, select the GPIO port one. If UART is enabled, by default, we are selecting the UART two. 
and for other interfaces. And this is the def, the board name def config in this example for the Colibri with the visible symbols. So this means that when the user type make menu config, it can see the symbols enable or disable. And so here is selecting the, the, the family, the core architecture, the SOC series, the board, and some, uh, uh, we are gonna use a UART console and some other default parameters. So let's see some debugging tips. So it's a, I think it's more a random debugging tip. So when I was implementing these, I've used uh, some of this stuff. So <coughs> first thing is when you are implementing a new SOC, try to look at some source code or reference to see how it is starting up, initializing that SOC. In my case, I use it at the free or pause. I think it's a very good uh, reference to be used. Uh, one thing seems to be not booting, you are not seeing anything in the console, try on the SOC source code file initialization, uh, access the UART registers, print a character or something just to see if it, things are coming up, okay? Implement the UART driver first, print TK is live, yeah? Uh, use some, some of the available system logins, Turn on the asserts to try to catch a horse, or even use an on-ship debugger uh, like a J-Link or U-Link. Uh, so this is uh, the um, hardware support checklist. So basically when you are adding a new hall, you are gonna need a kconfig file and a cmakes list, okay? Um, to include the source code that you want, you will have to import all the source code, but you only select and compile what you want. For a new SOC, these are the files that you need to add. Okay, it's just a checklist, I'm not gonna throw again. Uh, and for a new board, these what? These files. Uh, so contributing to mainline, so if you decide to contribute uh, the to mainline. You have a fancy board with you and you saw that it's not implemented on Zephyr. So first thing, you have to follow the coding standard, follow the commit guidelines. Uh, when you commit, they have a lot of checks that you check if your commit message is, uh, uh, is following the guidelines. Uh, so you will have to write documentation. There are documentation guidelines as well. Run the sanity check. He, uh, the sanity check, will, if you run locally, it will take hours. But you can hopefully at least uh, uh, choose your board that you want to test. Um, then there is a, a very good example of the contribution workflow, like uh, creating a, a, a fork from the Zephyr, your branch and then creating the pull request and all these kind of things. And even if you need to change your pull request, how you change, so there is a, a very good example here. Uh, when adding a new platform, uh, so you have to split your pull request in different patches. So a specific patch for adding a new hole and a specific one for each driver type you are adding. A uh, different one when you are adding an SOC uh, support and a different one when you are adding a board. And be patient. Uh, sometimes things are not that quick, takes long, but uh, it will happen. Uh, and yeah, this is it, so the references. Yeah, and any questions? Some vendors offer, uh, offer tools uh, to help us start up with our boards. For example, Cube by STM32, or things like that. So they'll help you configure the GPIOs, the clock, whatever. And they'll generate a startup code for you that you can just use. Is there a way to incorporate some of the uh, tools or the output of the, of the tools into when defining a new board? Or is there another graphic tool that Zephyr can offer? Mm. 
to as kind far of generate startup code. You mean like ST, you have the STM, yeah. Yeah, the, the Q, yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as I know, no, Zephyr doesn't have anything with this, uh, like this. Uh, the, S the STM cube actually is in Zephyr. It's there. It's used by some drivers. Of course, y if you are maintaining your own um, application, you can include if you want. But Zephyr... Um, Accepting these to mainline is a, is a different story. Maybe maybe Mari can even clarify better this. So we, we considered that. Um, I, I think the problem is, is sometimes those kinds of tools do the same kinds of functionality that you would see in kconfig or device tree. So they, they, there's some conflicts there. Um, so generally we don't have a lot of those kinds of tool output artifacts um, imported into the tree because at that point, once you import it in the tree, then you lose that flexibility that you have with kconfig to enable things, disable things like that. So, I mean, the closest thing that we have right now, and, and this isn't really a, 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 a graphical interface, but um, there was some work put into making sure that we have um, at least menu config enabled on all host platforms, because initially, you know, a lot of developers typically use Linux, and that's well supported on Linux, but um, because we also want to support development on host platforms, there was some work done to make sure that we actually have menu config support as well on Windows. Any more questions? One, two, three. Yeah, this is it. Okay, thank you, guys.